So now I want to step out again. So, so we looked at um, the formation of the moon, which I think was an interesting uh, story about how we come to conclusions about how things were formed. And we looked at the Earth's magnetic field, which is again an interesting bit of simple physics about the way that magnetic fields are generated by electric currents and the fact that that alone means that we exist because that magnetic field saved our atmosphere. Let's step out further now and start talking about the wider universe and the origins of our universe, the Big Bang. This is a picture of the night sky, and it's worthwhile just thinking for a minute about what we're talking about, how big that universe is. So this is a picture of the night sky from Earth. If you're an astronomer, you'll recognise the constellation of Orion, set up there. But I want to show you a little piece of sky, a picture of a piece of sky, which is somewhere around there. And it's actually a piece of sky that if you take a five pence piece and hold it about what, 25 metres away from you. So imagine a five pence piece 25 metres away and cover up the tiniest piece of sky. Then this picture is a picture of that piece of sky. It was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit around the Earth over thousands and thousands of seconds, over many nights. So Hubble just opened its shutter and took a picture. That piece of sky is almost completely black from the surface of the Earth. So you can see no stars there. But when you take this picture of that tiny piece of sky and keep your camera open for minutes and minutes and hours and hours, then you collect the light and you take this picture, which is called the Hubble Deep Field image, one of the most famous pictures in astronomy. Every point of light in that picture, other than about, what, three or four, is actually a galaxy, right? And you can see them. You can see there's a spiral galaxy there and some globular sort of blobby galaxies and some irregular shaped galaxies. Pretty much every point of light is a galaxy. Now, on average, those galaxies contain, what, 100 billion, maybe 200 billion stars like our sun. In every point of light in that picture, there are 10,000 galaxies in that picture. So that tiniest piece of sky contains 10,000 galaxies at least with 100 billion stars in each one. You extend that over the entire sky and there are something like 100 billion galaxies or more in the observable universe, each with hundreds of billions of stars. So the universe is immensely big, right? Um, but what's remarkable about this picture is that we understand what those things are made of and we've measured how far away they are and we can tell a lot about the origin and fate of the universe by just looking at pictures like this. How could you possibly do that? How could we even begin to decide what that place is made of? Because I should say that the most distant objects in that picture are something like, what, 12 billion light years away. Now, light travels at 300,000 kilometres every second. Or to put it another way, it goes about that far, about 30 centimetres, in about a thousand millionths of a second. So light travels extremely fast, 300,000 kilometres per second, but it's taken 11, 12 billion years to get from the most distant things in that picture. The Earth has only been here for four and a half billion. So most of the things in that picture uh, were emitting that light before the Earth was formed. Immense distances. How do we know that? Well, we know it because we can detect the light and we understand the way that light is made and we understand its properties. So this is just uh, the most complicated picture I'm going to show today, but it's a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. Because light, we know, is a wave, an electromagnetic wave. And the wavelength of that wave tells us what the colour of the light is uh, in the visible range of the spectrum. But electromagnetic waves go much further than that. Uh, as you go to longer and longer and longer wavelengths, you go out through infrared light, so heat, through microwaves, microwave ovens, to radio waves that you listen to the radio with. The wavelength of radio waves is something like a kilometre. So it's an electromagnetic wave with a wavelength of a kilometre. As you sweep in visible light, well, about something like a millionth of a metre, so very short wavelengths. And you can go on the other way. So ultraviolet light, X-rays, gamma rays, gamma radiation, where the wavelengths are a million millionths of a metre. So the only difference between a gamma ray or an X-ray and a radio wave is the wavelength of the light. Also, which is something that's quite interesting I want to mention for later, is how you make light at those wavelengths. You see, this thing here, this little thermometer, says temperatures of bodies emitting that wavelength. 
This is kind of interesting for later because if you heat something up, then it emits light. So you know that if you get coal and put it in a fire and set light to it, then eventually it starts glowing red. And if you got it hotter and hotter and hotter, it would get brighter and brighter, but also get whiter and whiter. So there's a saying, white hot. Right? Well, a particular wavelength of light is emitted by something that has a particular temperature. So very, very cold things, that's minus 273 degrees, for example, absolutely freezing cold. The light that would be emitted by something like that would be a microwave, something with a very long wavelength. Whereas if something is very hot, like the surface of the sun, 6,000 degrees centigrade, then it would emit light in the visible, and it would emit light actually somewhere around the yellow part of the spectrum. So the sun, when you look at it, is white or yellow. So the temperature tells you about the wavelength. What does that have to do with anything? Right? That's just what light is, electromagnetic waves. Well, let's look at the sun. Let's look at the light from the sun and split it up with a prism. So we look at the spectrum of light from the sun. It's a rainbow, which is not surprising, because rainbows are indeed just light from the sun split up by raindrops in the Earth's atmosphere. But when you look very closely at the light from the sun, then it's not a continuous rainbow. And this is very interesting. It has black lines in it. So although the sun glows and emits light all across the visible wavelengths, some of the wavelengths are missing. Why is that? Well, there are elements, chemical elements, in the atmosphere of the sun. There are elements like hydrogen, sodium, iron, oxygen, quite a lot of the heavy elements you need to make you and me, all in the sun's atmosphere. An atom is a nucleus with electrons going around it. And the electrons only go around the nucleus in particular orbits. Now, when an, an atom absorbs light, then those electrons can absorb light, and they can jump up to a different orbit, and then they can fall back down again. But they only absorb light with exactly the right amount of energy, with exactly the right wavelength to move the electrons around. So different atoms absorb different colours of light. And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing in the sun oxygen, which absorbs light at these very specific wavelengths because of its structure. And so it removes them from the spectrum. Hydrogen there, sodium there, two very famous lines in the yellow part of the spectrum. Iron, hydrogen. So you can see what the sun's made of. And indeed, all the stars in the universe and the galaxies in the universe, just by looking at the light and seeing what black lines occur in it. And you find that everywhere you look to the most distant galaxies, then the elements are the same. You see the same black lines. You see the signature of hydrogen, sodium, oxygen. Except for one very interesting thing. That is that they're all shifted. They all occur at slightly different places. And most of them have been moved towards the red bit of the spectrum. That's called redshift. What does that mean? Does that mean that the laws of physics are different at different places in the universe? Well, no, we don't think so. We have a simpler explanation than that. And that is that space itself is stretching. Now, that's a pretty weird thing to say. So let me just say that again. We think that space is stretching. So imagine a distant galaxy 10 billion light years away emitting light. And imagine that there is some hydrogen in that galaxy. Then we would see that little piece of the spectrum removed because there's hydrogen absorbing the light. Okay. But imagine that after that light was emitted and it began its 10 billion year journey to us, the space through which it was traveling was stretching literally stretching all the time, then the wavelength of that light would also be stretched. And if you stretch red light, then it gets more red. If you stretch yellow light, it moves towards the red end of the spectrum. Stretch blue light, it moves towards the green end of the spectrum. That's called redshift. And the interpretation is that the light, as I said, traveling through the universe and space itself was stretching, stretching the wavelength of the light. That's interesting. So hold that thought. Well, I tell you about something else remarkable, because we need two things to begin to piece together why space is stretching, what happened to the universe to cause it to stretch every year for billions of years.